Welcome back, viewers and listeners of your award-winning Let's Talk America with host Shana Thornton. Of course, I am Shana Thornton, and welcome to another live edition of Real Talk. And this is our video chat series where we put the spotlight on the trending topics that matter to you with the best advocates and experts out there. And of course, tonight is no exception. I'm so excited to have a friend of this show back on. It's been over a year, I believe. It's the one and only licensed family therapist, Tanel Jones. Miss Jones, welcome back to Let's Let's Talk America Radio. Thank you for having me back. Oh, so excited to have you back with your enthusiasm and your expertise in the area of therapy. Tonight, we're going to address a very important topic, one that's emotional and tied into mental as well. We're going to talk about some of the concerns post-COVID and also the stigma to get past it so individuals can really take advantage of the community resources out there to get better because better is certainly in the horizon. But as you know, today, one of the things we do on this show of Real Talk is we give our exclusive guests the opportunity to tell us a little bit about them. I know your resume is impressive. Trust me, we know that. That's why you're with us tonight. But I want to know the side of you, why you've dedicated years of your life to therapy and addressing the emotional and mental needs of so many different community members out there. Yes, thank you. Um, so I do a lot within the community and with the pandemic, my role switched in doing a lot for care team members and healthcare professionals to help manage a lot of the burnout that we see and rebuilding that resilience and that purpose and passion in the work that they do with all the lack of resources as a result of the pandemic. Um, so that's kind of where a lot of my focus is. And I also do a lot of private practice consulting, training and counseling work as well. I love it. So certainly you're dedicated to it uh, professionally and personally. Let's dive right into it. I don't need to tell you or anyone watching us tonight, uh, Tanel, on this Sunday evening that uh, COVID-19 was truly a crisis, a global crisis like no other. And often we think of the physical aspect of it. I'm sure by now many of us knew individuals that, that did die. It was, of course, a fatal virus for many. Um, but we're post-COVID now. We're coming out of COVID. The world seems to be opening back up. A lot of travel restrictions have been lifted. But I know experts like yourself, you've been in therapy again, uh, helping those individuals throughout the community with different concerns. You've helped them for many years. Um, I know your field of expertise are very concerned about some of the things that have resulted as of COVID. And maybe it's not fair to say I'm saying resulted as of COVID, but seems to be much more noticeable and magnified since COVID now seemingly has dwindled. We know there still are cases out there. We know that experts and government officials are still encouraging people to be vaccinated. Um, but let's be real. Tanelle, we know that COVID may not be the only type of virus or type of global um, pandemic, if you will, that may come up. There could be others, but let's talk COVID right now. What are some of the mental and emotional concerns going on uh, since the world seems that so many times have forgotten about COVID? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting you're saying we're talking about the pandemic, and I've been saying at least since last year that we're in a mental health crisis pandemic. There's an increased amount of you know, people reporting anxiety, depression, a lot more suicidal ideation seen, particularly with our younger, um, our younger generation, our younger kids. Unfortunately, you know, they they are um, engaging in a lot of self-harming behaviors and suicidal ideations. Um, so and just a lot more people just really feeling stressed about life. And then with the social changes, some people you know, as we learned about academics and how kids were impacted by that. And so just so many different components of what the pandemic did, yeah. isolating people or people feeling isolated. Um, I'm even gonna say the lack of resources when, there, you know, I'll say like with the pandemic and there were certain things like tissue shortage, some people that, that can make people kind of feel really anxious, you know, and okay. so maybe now they, they might start stocking up on things just to prepare for something to come ahead of time or, you know, so just so many different things that happened and it has happened as a result of the pandemic or kind mm -hmm. of the pandemic exacerbated, if you will, um, just people not feeling safe. And then we have the political unrest of our own society. So all these things are happening um, that's causing a lot of mental unrest, if you will. 
Yeah, great point. You are watching uh, Real Talk, produced by Let's Talk America with host Shana Thornton Radio. I'm Shana, executive producer and on-air host, and we are on with a very uh, renowned therapist, family therapist out of the Charleston, South Carolina area, the one and only Danielle Jones. She's back with us, and we're talking about emotional and mental concerns post-COVID, not just for adults that may be 35 or 55 years old, but also for our young adults. She mentioned that seems to be a very huge concern in her field of young people. And you did mention self-harming. I've got to ask a very important question for so many parents that are watching us right now or individuals that just simply care about their niece or nephew. Um, why does self-harming or other, um, uh, of course, very concerning um, issues like that for young people, why is it exposing itself now? And, and I don't want to pick on social media so much, but does social media play a role? Because when I look back over perhaps to nail the time you and I were being brought up or we were children, we did not have social media. It doesn't mean we didn't have the issues that exist now to some degree, but it does seem to be magnified. And there are some very concerning trends that have been gone on with certain social media outlets. I don't need to name to you um, that it seems to be attention seeking by so many young adults. Um, it's, you know, it seems like attention seeking. It's actually, when I talk about self-harming behaviors, that is when most people, a lot of young people, it is a way that they want to feel in control. And so they might engage in where we talk about eating disorder behavior or self-harming behaviors. If they feel like there's things outside of their, their life where they are um, not in control, whether it's trauma or they don't, they don't have like a routine, that is a way for them to feel safe, even though it's very unhealthy. So, um, so, so yeah, it is common. I think social media makes it worse because they have groups that like kind of a kids who like support that or they encourage each other to do it. Yeah, and if you see TikTok with all these dangerous trends yeah. and want to fit in, so if they feel isolated yeah. and alone in other areas, then they may do something like this to feel like they're connected to people, um, you know, if they feel alone in other areas in their life. Yeah, thank you so much for shining a light on some um, important, important information out there. Um, I want to talk about something that is, is real for so many adults as well, but children. And I think you also mentioned at the top of this segment, we're talking about a word of anxiety. And it seemed to have increased. And you said, for, for instance, when we had a shortage of toilet tissue, um, and now there seems to be still one of AIDS, supposedly, that's going on out there. And you're saying um, for in some individuals, right, not making a line of this at all, we may, you and I may say, oh, it's just a short of, a F of AIDS. But you're saying there are individuals who um, obviously, if they do have anxiety, it, it takes another level in their thinking and in their head. Um, one help us out. Where exactly does anxiety come from? And two, what's the solution to help people cope with it? Yeah, anxiety really is, it starts off as a very basic, normal emotion, worry. People worry about something happening or something not happening. And so they kind of spiral, you know, our minds can tell us so many different stories. And if, and so if you buy into those stories, if you believe those stories, then it can definitely get in the way of you doing what matters most. So I like to encourage people to first to start back by identifying what matters most to your life in your life. What is it that you value? How do you want to be? And even though you have these anxious thoughts, can you challenge them? Can you identify that, yes, this one scary thing might happen, but maybe there are also two or three other things that could happen as well. And you really that's won't right. know unless you just take the steps to do what you want to do um, that's important to you. Wow, great information. Talking to the one and only licensed our family therapist, Tanelle Jones. She's on Let's Talk America Radio. Tell me this, when it comes to anxiety, which seems to be a growing concern for young adults and adults out there post-COVID world, uh, did the isolation worsen it perhaps? I mean, and when I say by that in layman's term, no expert like you, but perhaps those anxieties could have been there possibly before COVID, but when the world got isolated, it sort of festered because as you know, many individuals were not getting the medical attention they needed, even though virtual uh, therapy sessions became uh, very widespread for some people, therapists like yourself or others that were doing it. But a lot of people, um, they said, unfortunately neglected their health. And I'm thinking not only were they not going to get an A1C checkup or get a checkup on their blood pressure, 
I'm sure they weren't doing a mental and emotional check-in. Is that fair? And how did, how did the isolation um, do or don't, only you would know that as an expert, perpetuate or worsen anxiety? Yes, excuse me. Um, so it can make it worse because again, people aren't around maybe what they identify as social support systems and, um, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Uh, and social support systems. So not having connection, people feel social anxiety. And also I would say maybe even um, just not access to certain resources. Again, we are a society that want to make sure we have everything that we need. And if yes. that anxiety kicks in, then it might be a, become a problem for, for some people and feeling like, okay, what's going to happen next, right? In terms of, um, in terms of, is, am I going to die? Like all those things that came up with the pandemic, am I going to die? Am I going to have everything I need to live healthy, healthy lifestyle? So it can yeah. be an important factor. Wow. I have to ask this. There was so much misinformation that was out there on some of our most mainstream social media outlets, you know, that I don't need to call them out by name. There were a lot of claims that just weren't true, that people seem to have been making up in their house or their apartment or wherever they live. But it was being presented. And you know this, it takes certain production angles to do it. It was being presented as if it was legitimate, valid information. Did that perhaps feed some individuals um emotional concerns that were there such as anxiety yeah i think anytime that there's and so again if people are already fear-based i think we operate sometimes in this world as a fear-based tactic that's what politicians mm -hmm. do um and so if people don't like seek out the factual information then it can have them spiral like oh my gosh yeah. what's the worst thing that can happen and so with anxiety i just want to kind of clear so anxiety is you have these thoughts. Yes. You're not necessarily understanding the thoughts or challenging the thoughts. And so once that thought happens, you follow it, it spirals, and then it keeps you from doing something. So you might start to isolate. You might say, I can't do this because I'm worried about what's going to happen. It okay. is more commonly, you might hear it just kind of discussed now, like yes. water. And he's like, oh, I'm so anxious. I'm so anxious. I believe that there are a lot of other emotions that are happening when you think about the pandemic, the grief that yes. people haven't processed. Absolutely. Um, can be um, really what's going on, but we are just, it's easy to identify it as anxiety, right? Instead of just yeah. sadness or grief. Um, and, and so I think that's why we hear people say anxiety a lot. Also something else, when we are exposed in social media, it does this, when we're exposed to a lot of trauma and tragedy, we de can develop kind of that empathic distress, which can also fuel some anxious type symptoms as okay. well. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, great point. I, I did want to uh, ask the second part of the question about anxiety. What's the solution? How can individuals improve? And, and let us know, once you have anxiety, do you always have anxiety? Or people can certainly live with it, but cope and have a productive life. Yeah, I think it just depends on what's happening. So I would encourage anybody that feels anxious and that anxiety that they're feeling is getting in the way of their everyday functioning to reach out for help and support. So, and then that that licensed professional can yes. tell you that really kind of what's going on. If it's actually more than anxiety, they can maybe you know um, diagnose mm -hmm. you with what actually what's going on, provide you with medication if possibly, or we have mindfulness, like learning mindfulness. There's so many different things that you can do that could be beneficial to address that anxiety. But first, 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 everybody go seek um, help or just talk to somebody yeah. just like you would to go see a doctor, like get a mental yeah. health checkup once a year. It is okay. <laughs> Yeah, I love it. Like you're saying, and even if they have to start with their medical doctor, if they're going for a blood pressure check or the annual visit to mention it to the doctor, and then I'm sure the doctor will likely obviously refer um, that patient to a therapist such as yourself, right? Yes. Yeah, some physicians yeah. may all, they, I know they usually um, provide medication for people who, you know, like present with depression, anxieties. I don't know if some physicians will provide medication for anxiety, but I would just say, even if you get medication, it is still helpful to go talk to a therapist to learn skills to effectively Absolutely. manage anxiety, depression, whatever your stress, all of those things that you might be experiencing in your Beautiful. life. Beautiful. 
And I think that's important to mention because obviously you are a medical expert as well. But and and obviously this information that myself and Miss Jones are discussing tonight on Let's Talk America Radio is for general information only and for specific concerns of your own medical, mental or emotional health or physical. That is, please speak with your own individualized therapist or physician. Um, But I think so many times. Um, Ms. Jones, people will say, well, I don't want to be placed on medicine. I don't want to be placed on medicine. And obviously that's a decision they'll have to come up with. But when they seek the expertise and advocacy of you and others, I think it's key for them to know there are options out there. And and obviously I, I support the medical community. I'm sure you do as well. You work with them, your colleagues, those primary physicians or internists that are out there. Um, but with that being said, like you're saying, even if they do uh, prescribe medicine or if they don't, what therapy can provide, right, are ways to cope and manage that may or may not include drug therapy, right? That is correct. Um, And coping could be things just, maybe there's things from your past that needs to be processed and the therapist Mm -hmm. can help you with that. Um, It can definitely, again, provide you with skills necessary to have the life that you want. And um, and that does mean making changes. I think sometimes that's hard. People struck with those changes. So even if you, like, I don't want to take medication, there might be things that you have to do. I'm a a strong advocate of of exercise. I'm a strong advocate Mm -hmm. of making sure you get adequate sleep. What we also don't talk about is that if you aren't getting adequate sleep, some of these things like stress and depression, anxiety can also amp that up. So yeah, yeah, making sure you're addressing all of all of that. That's so, so key to, because as you know, I mean, obviously it's treating the body holistically, right? I mean, the mind and all of our emotions that come with it are not isolated from what's going on in the body as well. So you're so right. And and we know now the third pillar of health is sleep, that S word. That is so, so important to get that rest that's so, so needed. Uh, Before we exit tonight, I've got to talk about the big D word and it's depression. And depression has always been on the radar of so many talk shows for decades. Um, I know coming out of post COVID now. And, and if this makes sense, here I am, uh, a, a layman, not a medical expert such as yourself. But when we think of depression, has depression in some individuals evolved or changed? I mean, and I know depression has a, has a, uh, a certainly a book, a text definition, but can it present itself in different ways that perhaps even you, an expert, someone who's treated people for years for different concerns, that it can present itself different in a post-COVID world? Is that true or still the textbook definition and things still appear the same, maybe masked a little different? Well, I think, you know, I think, I don't know if it's TV that maybe helps people or maybe people start to identify or not identify with something because they're like, I'm not depressed because I'm not landing in my bed. You can be Mm -hmm. depressed and still go and go to work and be around people. And Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yes, definitely. I like to define depression as kind of like there's this check engine light gone off in your car and you don't really know what's going on. You just know something is wrong and you can't do anything until you feel like you can figure it out. So you stop doing everything that matters to you. Wow. Wow. That's how I like to help people understand depression when they come and and talk to me. And it's really starting to re-engage into small things that used to matter first, while also talking about sometimes with depression, there's a lot of guilt because people feel like their life is not where they're supposed to be, or they've done things in the past. And now again, they just maybe feel really stuck. Um, And so it's just really, really hard and challenging for, for them and then that's where we unfortunately see a lot of the suicidal ideations because people feel like their life doesn't have meaning. So what's oh, the point? Man. And so, yes, it definitely can manifest um, differently for different people. I, see. So I would say to anybody that's wondering if they're, again, feeling depressed, your yes. doctor, you can go to your doctor. There, there's a, there is a survey that they can take that will let them know, okay. that to know that maybe they might have some depression. And so, again, it's going to ask about things like appetite, sleep, interest, interest in doing anything. Are you having any type of suicidal ideations? Mm -hmm. And sometimes it doesn't mean suicidal ideations doesn't mean you're like ready to go hurt yourself. It could just mean you're like more about death or will people miss me? You know, will people miss me if I'm not here? What's the point? I see. So before it gets to that place where you have an active plan, that's why we want you to talk to somebody. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Speaking of talking to people and getting help and getting the proper intervention, let's talk about the S word of stigma that still exists among uh, the world that's out there. Um, but I want to pinpoint something that may be very common between you and I, um, that many people who may feel they're not um, feeling themselves, if they do mention it to a family member, if they belong to a village of faith, uh, sometimes individuals may mention to them, well, you're fine. Um, certainly there are other means to do it. You can pray about it. And I obviously, personally, I am a person of faith and I'm not dismissing that, but I know you also are a person of faith, you know, and I want to talk right now to those individuals who may be um, a, surrounded by a mom who means well, right? A dad that does mean well. And you know, there are many individuals that will say there's nothing wrong with you, right? Um, and so you don't need any help. You don't need to go, if you will, tell that doctor you don't know anything about or Miss Jones, uh, the family business, if you will. Please address that because I think it's the elephant in the room for so many individuals around the world where it's perhaps preventing them from getting the help they need to nail when you're talking about uh, facing things and overcoming hurdles because perhaps, and, and I'm saying this, maybe mom or dad are not aware of it, or maybe they are intentionally aware of it, that other things in the family secrets, right? And every family has its own ingredients of what it is, right? If we're being honest, that's there and they may not want to address it themselves help us out i think one of the biggest challenges with um you know there are what how many different generations that's currently live every generation experiences things differently and so yes. parents who have younger kids and they're like you should just have like we didn't go through this we didn't i mean we say it as adults like you guys yeah. don't know y'all haven't made like, we <laughs> have to, and I think it's that not understanding that most kids are probably experiencing life based off of what's really happening now okay. and so as parents sometimes they want to be like well you should be okay because you have everything that you need you have your tv you have your car you have all these yeah. things given yeah. you because maybe some parents believe that I, they didn't want their kids to want for anything. But one of the things that could be missing is that ability to talk about their emotions and process their emotions and feel Beautiful. valid. Yeah. And what we know is that people want to feel validated and they want to feel valued. And Absolutely. I think that's true in the workplace and it's also true in, in your home. So helping kids feel valued and um, appreciated in the home can be beneficial. And that doesn't always mean giving them things. It could just mean yeah conversation with them about Beautiful. your feelings and about their feelings and validating them. Yeah, so powerful. And what about that individual? They're no longer underage. Perhaps they're 37 years old and they're dealing with a mother who uh, isn't quite convinced that they need to get the help seeking someone like Miss Jones. And, you know, there are millions of people around the world that may be experiencing that. And that could be uh, preventing them from getting the help they want. Once again, feeding into the stigma. Yeah, I, I you know, there are so many different things. If, you, if you're if you not sure, really, if you want to start out with talking to somebody, and if you can, there's a lot of self-help tools that you can probably get first that will have you answer questions that may then lead you to go see somebody. Um, so no matter if you are a young person and you feel like you need help, go tell your mom, talk to your school counselor. If you are an adult and you're still not sure, Maybe start out with your physician first. They, they have screening tools that they can um, guide you through and see if you do need to take the next step, but also maybe look into um, individual self-help re resources as well. Yeah, powerful. And to the point of mom and dad or grandparents that are out there, aunts and uncles, and it's not knocking them, but I think it is important to realize that other generations, right, not that one's better than the other, but they may be dealing with things in their own way that may not be the healthiest. Or to now, maybe it's fair to say maybe it works for them, but that doesn't always mean it works for you. That is fair to say. Say, yes, mm -hmm. we have to recognize that everybody experiences things differently and one size doesn't fit all. Absolutely. And I think so many times when you see so many conversations, uh, co cultural conversations on social media, one of the biggest things that keeps coming up is that so many younger generations feel that the older generations, just what you said, that example, well, you didn't have it like me. You didn't grow up in poverty. You didn't have this. They dealt with this. Um, right now, perhaps to that 69 year old that's watching us tonight, and all in there, they have told their son, just get over it. You know, perhaps you haven't gone through what I've gone through. I had it much tougher and I'm not complaining. Look at me. 
what would you say to that? Because I think that's a common conversation perhaps had that parents or the grandparents or the baby boomers may not be thinking could be a harmful one, but it goes back into not validating people's feelings because it's saying it's the competition and perhaps you grew up more poverty stricken. So what do you know about pain? But it doesn't dismiss someone else's pain. Speak right now to that, perhaps that baby boomer, if they're willing to listen to us, if you will, um, and trying to really uh, make the understanding that everybody's feelings matters and nobody's feelings are more important because perhaps the circumstance in their mind was more extreme. Yeah, I think it's important to, again, and maybe even as a 69-year-old, you're probably like, well, I had to go through that. And maybe it's also okay for you to talk to somebody because, you know, that's hard living. And it's okay to to talk about that with somebody that, that may not be your family or friend. And I know sometimes we want people to open up with, within our families, but families may not be the best support system when it comes to doing things like that. Mm -hmm. So yes, everybody's going to experience things differently. You may be able to offer some support to your loved one. I would just also say, let them kind of talk to somebody else as well, because family can't do therapy, therapy on other family members. So. <laughs> <laughs> and for even, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. And you know, as for, of course, as a professional, you're not even, I mean, physicians and therapists are not really supposed to even treat their own family for reasons that would not allow you to be as objective as you would need to be. So mm -hmm. such a, a great conversation, such a needed one tonight. Um, of course, talking about post-COVID, some of the emotional and mental concerns, we did highlight anxiety in adults and also young people and also depression. Also, Tanil Jones, of course, certified family therapist out of Charleston, South Carolina, also mentioned self-harm that a lot of young people may be dealing with as well. Uh, before we end, I've got to mention this. Um, when you talk about the stigma and about things, uh, people wanting to sweep things under the rug. For that parent, perhaps that father and that mother, they love their child dearly. Um, they see some concerns brewing, but they're no expert like Ms. Jones, right? They haven't chatted with many therapists uh, or interviews like Shana, and they have a question. But you know this, Tanelle, better than I do. There's an element of human beings that want to believe everything is okay. And so many times you know this, things will be okay. But sometimes it can be harming, right? You know this. Um, for many individuals, because to assume or to want everything to be okay, to ignore what's going on with a 17-year-old is very concerning. Right now, speak to that father, speak to that mother uh, that may see some things, they're not quite sure about it, but again, they've got so many things going on in their life, the last thing they want to hear is that news, and maybe they don't want to make more of it than it needs to be, and you know this better than I do, there is a belief for some people that if they bring it up, it could be worsening the situation, right? I'm not, I, I don't think that's necessarily the healthiest way to think, but there are people that believe well, if I bring up depression, then that's going to make them more depressed. If we bring up suicide, somehow that's going to put that idea in their head. Speak to that for us. Yeah, that's not um, factual. I think, again, what I would encourage people to do, sometimes when we go to a person and we're asking them what's wrong with you, that statement in itself can be very harmful. Absolutely. So maybe you can start with a question of what happened to you, right? Because then you might really hear them share their story and then that might help you decide that, yes, they do need additional support. Yes. When we say to people or ask them what's wrong with them, then that stigma gets set in like, oh, I'm not supposed to feel this way. Like That's something right. happened That's to right. me, I'm not supposed to feel this way. But in reality, if something bad right. happens to someone, those feelings are very valid. Who, you know- who wouldn't experience stress if they're about to maybe lose, right. their, and lose their family? So right. it's, it's learning to just say what happened to you um, so that you can then offer the best support. Yeah, and such a great point because I think so many people, especially older people, they say it, not sure they understand what they're meaning, but like you're saying, what's wrong? And let's be real, let's be frank. And I'm sure as a, as a certified licensed therapist, you'll vouch for this, that there are feelings and emotions that people have. Those feelings are valid at that time. And it's learning how to process and cope with those feelings, right? Yes, that is correct. Learning how to identify what the feeling is and then learn how to manage it. All, all feelings are not bad and we want to acknowledge them. It's just what you do with them. Absolutely. And before we go on that note, where you're saying all feelings aren't bad. If someone is feeling down and sad and the situation has occurred, so now I, I, I'm just assuming 
being a layman person, not a therapist like you, but like you said, there is validation if something's happened, if there was a breakup, if there's someone has passed away, how could someone not have feelings of sadness, right? Right. Yes. We, we, is the message is you're supposed to be strong. So nothing can be wrong with you. <laughs> so when I feel like something's wrong with me, but I'm told I'm supposed to be strong, then something must be wrong with me because I'm not strong. So I just don't need to talk about it because I'm going to get judged. Mm, wow. That sort of sounds a little chaotic <laughs> the way you put it that way. So at the end of the day, let's acknowledge those feelings, certainly. And when we're talking about that, people go through things. People go through romantic breakups. We know that you live long enough in life. That's bound to happen to you um, and other things as well. Uh, before you leave, that, leave us, when people do have uh, the feelings of the blues or even if it's full fledged depression, there are things that are situational, right? Where people can heal and cope. And it's, if, I, if I'm correct, from the therapy view side of it, the concern is when the coping um, skills are not being applied where you are coming out of some of those feelings and what you're doing with it. Am I right in that? Yes, you are. It's, and then the way that you may cope may actually, again, exacerbate some of those symptoms. So if you have a broken heart and you start drinking, then you develop an abuse to alcohol, then now you have a whole nother you know, um, set of problems that could impact your overall functioning. So thinking about the way you cope, not avoiding these feelings, finding a healthy way to discuss them and process them. Absolutely. I love it. It's all about processing, coping, and healing and getting better. And as you know, Jones, of course, licensed family therapist out of Charleston, South Carolina, said that uh, there are skills and resources out there and individuals you can talk to that will not judge, right? And as helpful as family and friends can be, uh, sometimes there's no uh, doubt that there will be judgment there only because they know situations and maybe they have their own opinion of how things should have been or they're quick to say, well, you shouldn't have done this. And I told you. So like she said, there are objective therapists out there who are willing to help what a great conversation. What a timely conversation for so many individuals out there uh, coping with life and things. There is help out there. Atina Jones, always a pleasure to have you on Let's Talk America Real Talk. Leave us with one powerful thought or statement uh, tonight covering uh, emotional and mental health. I think the one powerful statement that I will say is start to list out the things that you feel like you've lost and allow yourself to mourn those losses. We grief and in mourning is so helpful. And if you actually do that, then I think everything else will start to um, kind of maybe make a little bit more sense. We've lost a lot and it's okay to grieve yeah. those losses. Absolutely. And life keeps ticking. But yes, but it's all about we can be resilient and resiliency means knowing when to talk to someone, an expert like Tanel Jones. What a pleasure. Ms. Jones, tell us how our national listeners and viewers can learn more about your practice and connect. Yes, you can always email me at Tanel O Jones LLC. That's T E N E L L E O J O N E S L L C at Outlook.com. I love it. Thank you, Ms. Jones, for being on with us. Let's Talk America Radio. We're going to have you back on because emotional and mental health always matters. Thank you, everyone, for watching Real Talk, produced by Let's Talk America Radio. I'm Shana. Always appreciative of you tuning in. Do us a favor in the comments. Of course, go ahead and tag a family, friend, or anyone or a colleague. This conversation is relevant to all of us, okay? COVID is over. That's what we are being told, certainly, in so many levels, right? But there's a lot that came out of it and the healing we've got to keep pushing for. Thanks for tuning in. Stay tuned in for additional information. Visit LTARadio.com. That's LTARadio.com. Or simply connect with our hashtag on all of the social media outlets, LTA Radio. That's LTA Radio. Thanks again, everyone. Stay tuned and stay healthy. Thanks to Ms. Jones.